If you've read the financial news lately, you've undoubtedly been introduced to the bizarre concept of negative interest rates, which have already been adopted in Japan and increasingly are under serious consideration by central bankers in Europe and now in the US. Now, negative interest rates conceptually run counter to everything we know about building an economy based on savings and production. And they also conflict with everything Mises and Rothbard understood and taught about the function of interest rates in a society. So here to make sense of it all and to explain it for us is Paul Martin Foss, who is head of the Carl Menger Center, who is a longtime monetary policy aide to Congressman Ron Paul and also a frequent contributor to Mises.org. So stay tuned for an interesting interview with Paul Martin Foss. Paul Martin Foss, welcome back to the show. It's good to talk to you, and I've enjoyed all the things you've been writing lately, on, both on your own website and for Mises.org. Oh, I appreciate it. Nice to talk to you, Jeff. Well, so negative interest rates. It's all over the financial press. It was in today's Wall Street Journal on the cover. Uh, this article in particular was talking about the Bank of Japan. Uh, and what we're talking about, folks, is not just negative interest rates in terms of inflation-adjusted rates. We're talking about actual real, no, excuse me, nominal rates being below zero as potentially set by central banks. So first and foremost, Paul Martin, let's talk about the fundamentals of interest rates with the Austrian perspective on them, um, how Mises and Rothbard understood the function of interest rates. Uh, Mises, for example, talked about the originary interest rate, which was basically a discount apl uh, applied against future goods uh, for present goods. Right. And, and Rothbard was, was pretty much the same, too. I mean, they both understood that the natural rate of interest always has to be positive because people always will prefer to consume in the present as opposed to the future or prefer to consume near at a near point in the future rather than a far point in the future um so, i mean the concept of a negative natural rate of interest is just is absolutely absurd i mean that would mean that you're hungry and you say well i'll i'll eat two weeks from now well by that point you're dead it, it just it doesn't compute with reality okay so all other things being equal there's no scenario under which i would rationally uh, give you loan you a thousand dollars today in exchange for 900 in return a year from now Right. So talk about time preferences. I mean, explain to us what time preference means and how it applies to borrowers and lenders who would meet in the middle and develop an interest rate or a price. Well, I mean, time preference, again, people have different, differing time preferences. Some people prefer uh, to consume a lot more in the, fu uh, in the present than in the future. Um, the interest rate, you know, then is a function of what, exa what exactly is a particular individual's time preference. I mean, if you if you decide to set an interest rate of five percent, somebody may say, "Okay, I will, you know, go ahead and defer my present consumption. I will let you, you know, borrow this money because I don't need it that badly in the present, and in exchange, I'll get more in the future." I mean, and, and that's where, you know, it, it's one of the fundamental uh, things that allows economic growth to occur. I mean, savings and investment is how is how economic growth occurs. You have to have a positive rate of interest. Uh, I mean, Mises pointed this out. If you if you have government attempts to set a negative rate of interest or, or eliminate interest altogether, what you essentially have is, is capital consumption. There is no incentive to save and invest. And you consume your capital, and when it's gone, that's it. You have no more. You have nothing left to, to save, invest, and grow. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a uh, essentially a self-defeating uh, concept. Why do you think so many economists, not to mention the public, don't understand interest rates as prices. In other words, I'm telling you, I'm going to give you some money now. You're going to pay me that money back plus some interest. How much that interest is seems to me like a price for the loan. Yeah. I mean, and that's one of the things, you know, when I was working with Dr. Paul, we always, he always used to hit on that was this, this is price fixing. What the Federal Reserve is trying to do by, by setting certain benchmark interest rates is essentially price fixing. In a sense, in a sense you can kind of understand, I mean, when you, when you talk about a uh, for instance, monopolies too. I mean, people, a lot of economists will say, "Oh, yeah, monopolies are bad. We need to break them up." And you say, "Well, what about the government's monopoly on roads, the monopoly on the justice system, the monopoly on defense?" And immediately their minds go blank because they just it doesn't compute with their worldview. They're not willing to think outside the box. I think because it, you know interest rates are quoted in percentages or basis points, and because they're not quoted in necessarily in, in dollars or euros, people just don't bother thinking of them as a price, which is what they really are. 
Well, if we understand that conceptually, at least, interest rates would be positive, um, absent any sort of government or central bank intervention. Fast forward to today, um, Mises and Rothbard no longer with us. Do you think negative interest rates as being discussed and even implemented by central banks around the world, are these some, is this represent sort of a Hail Mary pass? In other words, we've had this extraordinary monetary policy period basically since the crash of 08. In Japan, we've had it far longer than that. Um, so they've tried zero interest rates. They've, twi- they've tried endless rounds of quantitative easing. Is this sort of the next, the next uh, gambit? Is this a Hail Mary? I think so. I mean, you have what, you know, Hayek called the fatal conceit. You have these central planners, these central bankers who think that they're geniuses. They think they can manipulate the economy just so, you know, set this variable to this and this one to that and everything's going to be just fine. And they've, I think they realize now that their, their models have failed. They don't know what to do and they're literally grasping at straws. And they figure, well, this is pretty much the only thing they can, they can do at this point. They've exhausted, I mean, they've, QE, they've pumped trillions of, of dollars into the system. The ECB has done the same thing with their monetary easing. The Bank of Japan has you know, pumped a few trillion yen into the system. They just really don't know what to do. They're, they're, they're grasping straws, basically throwing something at a wall, trying to see if it's going to stick. And it really, it's going to end up being a failure. I mean, if you look at the ECB, if you look at the, uh, you know, why they went to negative interest rates, I forget, what was it, a year, year and a half ago? They said, well, we, we don't want these banks parking their reserves at the central bank, so we're going to institute negative interest rates. That money's going to get forced out in the economy, and they're going to loan it out to people, and everything's going to get better. Well, when you look at the actual numbers of reserves that are parked at the ECB, you'll see a you know, small dip when that first negative interest rate kicks in, but then it increases again. It comes right back up to where it was. It was a, you know, It's a complete failure from a, from a uh, practical perspective because the banks – a lot of the banks figure that, well, we'd rather take a guaranteed loss parking our money at the central bank rather than loan it out and risk losing all of it. Um, and so it just it just doesn't work. I mean, it's both theoretically and practically uh, a bad idea. But this term has been bandied about for the limits of monetary policy, in other words, pushing on a string. Uh, it, it seems like you, you can't force banks to make uneconomic loans to insolvent borrowers, right? I mean, in other words, both business and household debt worldwide, but certainly in the U.S., have increased since the crash of 08. Right. And, and you know, we have such, a, such an uncertain regulatory regime, monetary regime, business climate. Nobody knows when the other shoe's going to drop. Everybody has a, this kind of sense of foreboding that something bad's going to happen. They want to park their money in the bank. They want to hold cash. They want to keep things safe and just wait and see and you know, you've, but then you've got these central banks on the other hand are saying, no, 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 don't park it, don't be conservative, push the stuff out there, lend money, you know, more debt, you know, more consumption. That's the way to to stimulate things, and people just aren't going to respond to that. I mean, there was a Wall Street Journal article I think last week that said that uh, some study had said that in the euro area, a, a negative interest rate could co- possibly go as low as negative four and a half percent. That's mind blowing. I mean, when was the last time you even saw a positive four and a half percent on, on say, a, a, a bank savings account? Wouldn't happen. So to think that it could go to negative four and a half percent is just, and that's of course that would be the rate that the banks are being charged. Of course, if they pass those on to the consumers and the depositors, you can guarantee it's going to be even even lower than that. Um, so it's it's just mind blowing, you know, what kind of uh, policies they're trying to push right now. Well, you mentioned it hasn't worked in Europe. The ECB has not been able to force uh, member banks into into increasing uh, loans, at least not much. Now, let's say hypothetically in the U.S., let's say the Fed was able to achieve this. And so commercial banks no longer parked their reserves with the Fed, or at least not in the numbers they do now. And they sort of pushed this out in the public. And commercial banks responded by charging consumers negative interest rates on their deposit holdings. Um, would that not create an immediate sort of flood into banks to withdraw cash? I mean, that seems like the rational response to me. Right. I mean, that, that is the biggest fear, obviously, is that people are just going to start pulling the money out of banks. Uh, you collapse the deposit base, which means all the loans have to get called in. Uh, if the, of course, because of a fractional reserve banking system, if too many uh, deposits are withdrawn and the, the bank can't cover it and it goes under. If you're talking a Bank of America or a Wells Fargo or, you know, one of these large commercial banks that maybe has some large institutional uh, deposit holders too, who start to 
say, well, you know, why store our billions at the bank? You know, maybe it's cheaper. And you see this, I, I think, um, I want to say it's uh, Switzerland, some places in Europe where some of these businesses are now starting to say, well, it's actually cheaper for us to just buy a safe and park, and park the stuff, you know, in a safe in our own business rather than hold a bank account. Uh, and if they start start doing that, then you, you kind of get this uh, domino effect, this, this spiral of, uh, you know, deposit withdrawals and, and bank collapses that will eventually, uh, you know, create this huge, huge spiral that it will take down the banking system. That's that's the really big fear if you try to push these negative interest rates. And the thing is, because this is uncharted territory, nobody knows exactly, you know, where that border is, where that limit is. And if you, you know, the Fed obviously doesn't know that. Remember, you know, they're all their economic data is about three to six months outdated. So if they push negative, try, try to push, push negative interest rates past that border, by the time they realize, oh crap, we did something bad, you know, the whole banking system may have been brought down and it's too late to save it. Well, the irony here is that all of this, of course, sounds deflationary, which is which is what central bankers live to fight, right, is deflation. Um, I, I'm just curious, though, if commercial banks... It did experience a run. You know, the cash just isn't there. The physical cash is not there. Uh, if you go to your bank and try to take out even five or ten thousand dollars, they oftentimes your local bank branch simply won't have it. Well, I remember when I was working for Dr. Paul, we took a, uh, a trip up to the New York Fed, and they showed us the uh, underground vault where they store the gold. And they showed us a couple other vaults where they had printed all this. Uh, I guess it was in the aftermath of 9/11. They printed billions and billions of dollars of cash because they were afraid that there were going to be bank runs and people were going to start pulling money out of the bank and going to ATMs and everything was going to run dry and there wouldn't be enough physical cash. So they have pallets and pallets of physical cash down there at the New York Fed. Now, I, I doubt there's you know, still not enough to, to go around in the, in the event of a really, really big crisis. But uh, I mean, I know that they are sitting, at least as of about three years ago, they're still sitting on some, on some of those pallets of 50s and 100s. But of course, one way to fight this is to de declare war on cash, right? Um, take $100 bills out of the system, which has been floated in just recent days by the awful former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers, and it, all of a sudden it gets pretty hard to hold significant wealth in cash. Right. And if, if they end up banning cash and going to mandatory digital payments, uh, where everything is in the bank and through some sort of electronic payment system, they're, you know, they're going to be able to force negative interest rates on you because then what can you do? You know, your bank decides to push a negative 2% interest rate on you. Well, you can't pull your money out of the system unless you buy food or clothing and use that as kind of a, a barter uh, method. But all you can do is transfer it to another bank that you hope has a slightly higher but still probably negative interest rate. Um, it makes it very difficult for consumers to escape uh, these monetary shenanigans if, if uh, the war on cash continues. You know, Paul Martin, we just have time for one last question. But it, if you step back and look at all this uh, from a distance, you know, it really goes to the two basic perspectives that have dominated economics in, let's say, the last 150 years. One, you could loosely term uh, the Austrian school based on Say's law that says, you know, savings and production are what grow an economy. The second, the now dominant strain of economics we might call neo-Keynesianism, which basically says aggregate, aggregate demand is king and we need to stimulate it. And it seems like uh, the triumph of the latter viewpoint uh, is being sorely tested in what's happening today. Yeah, and I mean, I think for the last, you know, at least fifty years, what we what we've had is because, uh, you know, we've had negative rates of return on, say, bank accounts. I think the Bundesbank did a study that showed that people who deposit money in the bank for the past fifty years have lost money every single year. Uh, we've we've had kind of a slow motion uh, capital consumption, as Mises said, would occur. Um, we've basically been testing, you know. Kind of these, we've basically been the lab lab rats for for Keynesianism for the past 50 years. We're, we're reaping the, the the negative effects of it: capital consumption, uh, monet, huge amounts of monetary inflation, especially after the gold window was closed. I know a lot of people in the United States. I know we're starting to wake up thanks to the good work that the Mises Institute is doing and all the resources people can uh, find there. They're they're starting to open their eyes and realize what exactly the Fed's doing wrong and what the ECB is doing wrong. The, que the question is, when are the policymakers going to finally admit their fault? I mean, the, the, two, the two most difficult phrases, uh, I think, to, to utter in the English language are, I'm sorry, and I don't know. And, uh, and for people who have spent their entire careers in government and academia and risen to the level of the Federal Reserve or, you know, member of the Board of Governors, 
last thing they want to say is, I don't know, or I'm sorry, or I can't help, we don't know what to do. Uh, I, I really think they're just going to keep stumbling and, and, and bumbling into uh, a complete economic collapse. Well, one thing we know for sure is you cannot create prosperity simply by punishing people for saving money and accumulating capital. Paul Martin Foss, thank you so much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend.